Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Clark, and I'm uh, head of professor of music here in Oxford and a professorial fellow at Wadham College. Um, and it is the college, in a sense, that is hosting this uh, great event today. So um, you're all extremely welcome to, to this event, which, which celebrates the launch of this fine, the third volume in the series of books that have emerged from Reinhard Strom's um, fantastic project um, towards a global music history. And uh, it, it's my role simply to kind of vaguely chair the proceedings in as light handed a way as I possibly can. And I'm sure it will need very little steering. So um, the, the kind of um, schedule for today is that there will be a series of presentations, four presentations by um, people who have been involved with this um, amazing project over the last few years. Um, and after each presentation, we will have a, an opportunity for some questions and answer and, and discussion. And at the end, depending on um, how the time goes, there may be a period at the end towards six o'clock where we can have some more general discussion. Um, I think it would probably be a good idea if most people, if you would keep yourselves muted um, during the presentations, because there are sometimes problems with feedback and various kind of sound uh, issues. So without further ado, let me um, introduce um, the first speaker, Reinhard Strom, who probably needs no introduction, but I will nonetheless give him <laughs> as full an introduction as he deserves. So Reinhard studied musicology, Latin and Romance literatures and the violin in Munich before studying for a PhD at the Technische Universität in Berlin with Karl Dahlhaus, no, no, no other than. From 1970 to 1982, he was co-editor in Munich of the Richard Wagner Gesamtausgabe, and from 1975 to 1983, he was first lecturer and then reader in music at King's College London. From 83 to 90, professor of musicology at Yale University, then back to King's from 1990 to 96 as reader and then professor of historical musicology before being appointed as head of professor of music at Oxford from 1996 to his retirement in 2007. He is a corresponding member of the American Musicological Society, a member of, a member of the Akademie der Wissenschaften in Göttingen, and a fellow of the British Academy. He has, as I'm sure many of you know, astonishingly wide-ranging research interests. 18th century Italian opera, particularly of Handel and his contemporaries, with books on Italian opera seria of the 18th century, the 18th century diaspora of Italian musician, music and musicians, and a two-volume work on the operas of, Antia, of, of Vivaldi. He's also an authority on late medieval music and its social context, with books on music in the late medieval Bruges, the rise of European music from 1380 to 1500, music as concept and practice in the late Middle Ages, Guillaume Dufay, and an edited facsimile of the Lucca Choir book. And as if that wasn't enough, he has published extensively on modernist and postmodernist debates in musical historiography, including contributions to musicology and its sister disciplines, Michael Talbot's edited volume, The Musical Work, Reality or Invention, and much more besides. But of course, most relevant to today's event was the award of the Balzan Prize in 2012, um, with the German musicologist Ludwig Fincher and the Hungarian composer Georgi Ligeti being the only two previous Balzan Prize winners in music in the whole history of the prize. It was this incredibly prestigious prize that allowed Reinhardt, with great vision and generosity, I have to say, to establish his project towards a global history of music with its 14 workshops and all the encouragement and support that those, those workshops have provided for younger and more established researchers alike. And so now with the publication of the third volume in the series of books that have resulted from that project, here we are today at the launch event. So Welcome everyone to this very special moment and congratulations Reinhardt on the absolutely wonderful achievements of this amazing project. And so I hand over to you Reinhardt to give your presentation. 
Thank you so much, Eric. Well, that's uh, very comprehensive, and uh, um, I apologize to everybody uh, that they need to uh, listen so much about to uh, words about me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, um, what we like to um, communicate is uh, something about a book, or in fact, about a research that is ongoing, and of which um, this book, uh, Transcultural Music History, is the latest published uh, book. It will not be the very, very end of this project, uh, but I say about that a little later. I particularly have to thank my wonderful collaborators and authors of the book, because I myself not actually an author in this last volume. Um, in, in, in the three volumes that you have mentioned, Eric, that came out in the years 2018, 19, and now uh, this January, the three volumes uh, comprise um, uh, chapters by 52 different authors. Um, and uh, some of them have written in more than one volume, uh, but of course, um, everybody has very precious things to say. And I have to say, obviously, um, now um, uh, the audience, you, you will now hear only um, a very small uh, um, selection of those authors. Uh, it would be uh, nice to let uh, everybody appear here, but uh, we had to uh, um, restrict ourselves. So uh, we have um, 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 decided uh, to have only five short presentations about um, vital, important sections of this new book. Um, and uh, um, this will be shared by um, um, myself with Anna-Maria Busseberger, Keith Howard, Daniela Fugele, and Christina richter Ibanez. And I now want to show you my PowerPoint, if I may. I hope it works. Share screen. Sure. I don't know how you can... Can everybody see this PowerPoint now, please? Yes. Yep. Yes, yes we can. Okay. okay. Um, here you see a little bit of an oversight of what the uh, what the book is called and uh, who is speaking now uh, today. So that is uh, information that is, in a sense, already uh, given. So anyway, a warm welcome to all of you um, who are now attending, and many thanks for your interest in this event. Uh, this is hosted at Wadham College uh, through uh, the events and um, communications officer Salome Parker and on the faculty of, on the, at the Faculty of Music through head of professor of music Eric Clark. I'm Reinhard Strom, an emeritus who at age 70 found an overwhelming new interest in the world of global music history. Many others, and probably some of you in the audience here, have developed such an uh, um, interest much earlier in life, or are considering doing so now. Then best luck with it. You will have experienced or already explored the unprecedented rise of global discourses in all cultural matters, as well as in politics, economy, economy and science. You, you know, of course, that environmental destruction and pandemics are now threatening to get a step ahead of our own global thinking. Now, we musicians are catching up with this state of things um, and uh, opening our ears and accommodate our voices to ever more different sounds and also promote shared knowledge and inclusivity about music um, with new research. As already said, I was awarded the uh, um, research prize of the International Balsan Foundation of Milan in 2012, which gave me the marvelous chance of starting an um, international research project of my own choosing. With the decisive support of the Faculty of Music under Professor Eric Clark um, and also the Department of Music um, at Zurich University under Lawrence Lütiken, as well as experts in several countries, I started on a road of exploration, which I called Towards a Global History of Music. This idea itself was not new. Musicologists had followed the paths of ethnology and cultural anthropology for decades. The concept of a world music 
an inclusive heritage may already be found in writings of the 18th century enlightenment. But in addition to the publications and academic structures existing in 2012, there are now at least four new international research groups on global music history. And many further um, important publications and initiatives. I'm here showing only three slides of uh, new groups that have actually been constituted and have already been active uh, for your exemplification. There are more than these. This is, of course, a groundswell far beyond the field of, field of music. The International Balsam Prize, to speak of one, was awarded in 2018 to uh, Jürgen Osterhammel for global history and in 2019 to Michael Cook for Islamic studies, just to name a few. In my own project, three books have arisen from the papers of 14 workshop conferences held in the years 2013 to 17. The new voices of those 52 authors create something like, as we called it, a concert of different voices represented in the cover image of the present volume where hands and musical graphemes symbolize a non-hegemonial musical collaboration. The concert of our varied researches was meant to reflect what I call the global participation and the regional diversity of the musical world itself. Not an additive assembly of various musics, nor a grand narrative of more coherence than realism, but thoughts on data that promoted inclusion and discussion. Against the globalization scare felt by many people today, who prefer to retreat into nationalism and to protect imaginary borders, we hoped to set outreach and participation. The knowledge about musical practices in different world regions which the delegates of the workshops provided from their self chosen researches and which the entire series aims to disseminate is unavoidably miscellaneous. We have, however, grouped the contributions according to some larger themes or cultural areas which indicate common concerns, but also regional diversity. For example, in the first volume, um, when you look at the um, uh, uh, titles in red, uh, uh, these are basically um, uh, chapters of the book, a part of the book, uh, um, according to world regions. But the first one, which uh, deals not only with Europe, is entitled Enlightenment. In the second volume, the music road, which itself is uh, concentrated on a particular world region from the Mediterranean to India, uh, you see we have basically historical fields or historical uh, um, eras, um, which uh, um, uh, occupy the most important items in here. That is one of the workshops, uh, multiple musical cultures on the relationships of power um, that uh, try to uh, sum together, sum up together um, um, a theme which is common to Eastern Europe and the Middle East, uh, that they always um, have been uh, um, um, under the uh, regimes of very large scale powers. And the question was, how does uh, this, this actually affect their musics? In this uh, present uh, volume, Transcultural Music History, uh, we have four main subjects, uh, which will uh, be further elaborated later. Uh, the historiography of African music, martial and military music traditions, global views on Bach, and media and transcultural music history. In this way, the volumes offer not only a pottery of research, but also repeatedly address and debate general historiographic concepts, for example, enlightenment theory, orientalism, hegemony and provincialization, influence and cultural entanglement, transcultural theory. The project workshops include musical and dance performances, visits to museums of ethnology, guest lectures, and interviews with musical performers from various parts of the world. Here are a few examples of um, 
uh, the actual music that was performed at the workshops of this uh, project. I have to go rather quickly through this. Um, uh, so these are just examples. Also art music of Latin America, for example, uh, uh, was uh, was heard in an excellent concert. Um, um, Trio Sonata composed by an Italian uh, uh, monk uh, who visited China in the early 18th century. Indian dance and music by um, specialized uh, performers. And uh, um, an intercultural uh, or uh, transcultural uh, uh, group who uh, perform music from the Eastern Mediterranean, but also from the Western Mediterranean. And finally, um, a group in uh, Germany, uh, composer Maximilian Gut, who uh, uh, performed a marvelous composition on the basis of Handel's Messiah with African instruments. <laughs> the inclusivity of our concept did not stop at musical cultures of the past. History writing has in fact been a distinguishing feature of the project. I believe that respect, respecting people means respecting where they come from and what they transmit. Their cultural past is the greatest global treasure. Chapters in the second volume, The Music Road, for example, go back to East-West imaginations of one to 2,000 years ago. In the present third volume, musical developments of the modern and postmodern age are picked up at their transcultural delivery points in and outside Europe. By transcultural, we understand practices that exist because their practitioners have acted across borders, guided by a transcultural or global consciousness. Max Peter Baumann's introduction to this last volume reviews this research field. The four main parts of the book address different aspects of musical life where a transcultural consciousness is paramount. These are, I go back to an earlier slide where you can see the main parts of the present book, the historiography of African music in its strikingly contrasting articulations by African and Western voices since the 19th century. This is about actually African musicology as well as Western views of African music. Then martial and military, military music traditions, a global kind of practice which hovers between order and chaos and uses music for both. Global views on Bach, the performance and interpretation of Bach's music as a global as well as national heritage in East Asia and Latin America. And media and transcultural music history where technical and scientific tools of the modern age impact on the globalization of musical imaginations. May I conclude with a few words about this last section entitled Media and Transcultural Music History. Here we started with the question to what extent electronic and digital media, while seemingly giving us access to music of the entire world, can eradicate global power structures or enable local voices away from the powerful centers. In these five studies, transcultural technology is in fact shown as serving regional interests and even affirming diversity, although power structures and hegemonies remain. James Kirby's expert scientific analysis of musical settings in sonic languages, Vietnamese and Thai, also illustrates a historical process of adapting regional music production to cultural change. James Mitchell has reconstructed the history of music recording in Thailand with its remarkable negotiations of independence and westernization in a never colonized nation. The archival recordings of the Polish radio experimental stu studio PRES between 1957 and 2003 are now being remastered, leading Darius Prostek to the reassessment of an internationalist musical practice under communist and nationalist working conditions. The question is whether the power that once controlled this media now resides in the archive. 
Razia Sultanova unfolds the cultural panorama of Moscow's two million Muslim immigrants and their audiences, while music and media strengthen the ethnic and religious cohesion of a particular group, they also open it up to others, like a house whose walls are all windows. Tom Weston concludes this volume with a criticism of sound recordings on ethnographic archives in the face of migration. I quote him, sound archives are built upon silence, wherein displaced and placeless people have been denied representational space in soundings of nations, end quote. Yes, we had almost forgotten that the transcultural world is not an assembly of national cultures only, certainly not in music, not in the digital age, and especially not in an age of migration. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, uh, Reinhardt, very much for this very um, fascinating overview of the, the, the work that this project has been doing. Can I suggest that we, if we now have a, um, a brief period for um, questions and so on, if people have questions, if they could um, use the chat area just to put the letter Q, if you just put the letter Q for question into the chat, then I will um, call upon those people whose names I see with a Q next to them to ask a question. Um, I propose that we should limit these question and answer sessions to quite a short um, period. Uh, so I will move on quite quickly if it turns out that people don't at the moment have questions they want to ask. I might just ask this of Reinhardt if yes, I may. Um, and that is, as you, as you indicate with this kind of overview of the project, it's a complex sort of interpenetration of history and geography. And I just wondered, um, whether you had any comments about both the, the kind of difficulties and the opportunities that that kind of um, entanglement of history and of, of time and place, if you like, represents for the project that you imagined. Yes, uh, certainly uh, um, one of the major problems uh, which we encountered uh, unexpected, uh, which others have encountered all along, is of course um, the um, um, periodization of history in, in our Western culture um, is entirely Eurocentric, uh, Western-centered, and uh, does not apply and cannot be applied uh, to most other world regions. Um, and uh, of course, um, um, uh, this is one of the reasons why other um, uh, attempts to describe something like a global musical culture um, have um, uh, concentrated and focused on modernity. Uh, or on the 20th century modernism, uh, because there it seems that we have more or less the same sort of period feeling, uh, uh, whether it's um, in, 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 um, in the West or in the East. However, if you can go to the Middle Ages, so you cannot even call that what uh, happened, let's say, in Africa or uh, uh, South America uh, during what we call Middle Ages. <laughs> so they didn't have it. Um, that is, uh, may, may seem trivial, uh, but there are, of course, many other problems uh, that have to do with the notions of progress um, and, uh, and the notions of coherence. Uh, it, so that is was one of the one of the several problems. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Razia Sultanova, you you had uh, you wanted to make a comment, please. Yes, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, Professor Reinhard Strom for publishing these lovely books. You know, I have two of them, but anyway, it's a real, um, you know, great, great contribution to the uh, um, scholarly, uh, you know, libraries and for uh, students and for colleagues and so on. But I would like also to point out that the direction which Professor Reinhard Strom has chosen as the global history of music has produced uh, indeed several uh, different bodies, uh, not only uh, the, which uh, Rainford just has shown us, uh, not only within the 
um, International Music Society, but also within the ICTM. And uh, I'm the, as a, the chair, and Margaret is here, <laughs> the secretary of our new, newly established uh, ICTM study group on global history of music. We are in preparation of the huge international uh, conference in China, Sichuan Conservatory in the middle of May, the conference unfortunately online, which is called Global History of Music. And it's all happens thanks to you, to your uh, huge contribution. Thank you very much, Professor Strom, uh, and for your encouragement and for your stimulation. So we're very happy to follow your very interesting way, you know, your discovery. And we are uh, really lucky to be involved in your workshops and your seminars, conferences, and so, on, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Russia, too, and all the best for you. Um, undertakings yeah it certainly invites and uh, encourage uh, um, our audience here to join the ICTM uh, study welcome, group yes. of global music history as well as others there's nothing uh, against joining more than one group thank you thank you very much thank you great well thank you so much Razia that's a lovely comment on which I think to move on to our next presenter um, today so our next presentation comes from Anna Maria Busseberger, who is Distinguished Professor of Music at the University of California, Davis. She has published articles and books on notation, on, sorry, I've just lost my screen for some reason, on notation, <clears throat> mensuration and proportion signs, music and memory, mathematics and music, historiography, and music in African mission stations. It is indicative of the interdisciplinary nature of her work that she has won major awards from scholarly societies representing the three musicological disciplines, the American Musicological Society, the Society for Music Theory, and the Society for Ethnomusicology. She's had fellowships at the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies in Florence, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanford Humanities Center, the University of Vienna and the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. Her books include Mensuration and Proportion Signs and Medieval Music and the Art of Memory, which won the Wallace Berry Award from the Society of Music Theory in 2006. And she is the co-editor together with Jesse Rodin of the Cambridge History of 15th Century Music. Her most recent book, the Search for Medieval Music in Africa and Germany, 1891 to 1961, was published last year. In 2019, Professor Busseberger was made an honorary member of the American Musicological Society and received a large award from the Henry Luce Foundation, together with her colleague Henry Spiller, to research a music history of Indonesia. So you are very welcome, Anna Maria. And over to you um, for your presentation. Thank you so much for this very generous introduction. Now, I would also like to say something about Reinhard. Reinhard and I are both medievalists, but let me tell you, he was not your normal medievalist throughout all of his publications. He thought always, first of all, very interdisciplinary, and he always had the global context in mind. He was the first one to talk about Central European, Eastern European, and now about uh, music all over the world. It's, uh, he, uh, he has inspired me in so many ways I cannot begin to tell you. So my uh, contribution, I, uh, I will start uh, with very short uh, reference to my book. Um, and let me uh, begin as follows. When I was nine, my father was asked by the Lutheran World Federation to become director of a seminary to educate the future leaders for the Lutheran Church of all over Africa. So we went to Tanzania for two years and this was a profound experience for me. I heard for the first time African congregations sing Lutheran chorales, Gregorian chant, and it sounded completely different from what I was used to in Germany. So about uh, 10, 11 years ago, I decided to investigate mission archives. And very quickly, uh, and this is the result, is this book uh, which just appeared last year. But very quickly, it uh, became, whoop, it doesn't move on. Um, oh, here, okay. Very quick, no. Ah, very quickly, it became clear to me that if I wanted to explore missionaries and understand how they dealt with mu music, 
I had to um, investigate where these missionaries came from. And one of my great surprises was that they were in close contact with comparative musicologists in Germany. Comparative musicologists are the predecessors to ethnomusicologists. They were in uh, constant contact and many of these missionaries did important uh, uh, ethnographic research and music research. Now, uh, the central character in uh, comparative musicology is Erich, was Erich Moritz von Hornbostel, who was the first director of the Berlin Phonogram Archive. Uh, he became director in 1905. Hornbostel uh, gave every colonial administrator or missionary a free phonograph as long as they sent him back the recordings to Berlin, which he would then evaluate. Uh, what was his agenda? He looked for the origins of music. He wanted to find out how music was at the very beginnings. And he thought by comparing music from all over the world, he would figure this out. It was very much modeled on comparative linguistics, which also took place in Berlin a hundred years earlier. So Hum Wilhelm von Humboldt and Bob and all of these guys. Um, now, uh, what was a, a, a notable thing for me uh, as I did my research was that also around 1900, nobody had any idea how medieval music really sounded. And Hornbostel and his students, as well as the missionaries in Africa, all believed that medieval music was similar to non-Western music. So many of Hornbostel's students, in particular Mario Schneider, thought they could reconstruct uh, medieval music if they did a thorough study of non-Western music. There is only one person who didn't believe in this. And this is a completely unknown individual called African from Sierra Leone called Nicholas Taylor Balanta. He was born in 1893 in Sierra Leone and died in 1962 completely forgotten. Uh, he said very forcefully, and he published only three articles during his lifetime, and he published, and this is the, by the way, the article of my, uh, in, in the volume of Reinhardt, uh, it is on, essentially on Balanta. Uh, he published three articles during his lifetime, and they are all in out of the way places, and very few people have read them. The only other detailed discussion is by Tobias Klein in Berlin. So uh, who was this Balanta? First of all, I managed finally to get a photograph from him, uh, which was very hard. He's the second person on, on the left, this person here. He uh, was brought to the US by a very generous philanthropist called George Foster Peabody. And uh, George Foster Peabody made sure that he got admitted to Juilliard. He got a very good music education at mm -hmm. Juilliard. And after that, uh, Peabody orchestrated that um, uh, Balanta got the first Guggenheim Fellowship ever in music history. In 1926, he got it, and it was renewed in 1927. Now, Guggenheim uh, Foundation has, it's a, it's a very prestigious fellowship, the most prestigious you could get in music at that point. And this went to a Black person from Sierra Leone. We just have to realize that. Uh, and he uh, managed uh, to persuade uh, Franz Boas, who was the famous anthropologist who was at Columbia at this point, who met Peabody and was very impressed and wrote a glowing letter, uh, not, not Peabody, who met Balanta and wrote a glowing letter about Balanta. And another person who wrote a letter of recommendation was Henry Frick, the founder of the Frick Museum. This is also quite remarkable. Now, Boa suggested that Balanta shouldn't simply go to Africa but because, because his project was to investigate African music from an African perspective. He it was all about being African and not uh, Western, and he's going to uh, do a detailed study of African music from an African perspective. So uh, Boa suggested that before he goes to Africa, he should spend six months with Hornbostel in Berlin which he did. Uh, I don't think they had a close relationship, but we know that he was there. Hornbostel provided him with the phonograph uh, and uh, uh, expected him to send the phonograms back. In addition, Peabody had the uh, uh, suggestion that he should speak at the International Missionary Conference in Lesoute in Belgium 
to the missionaries from all over the world about African music. Now, these missionary conferences were huge events. All mission societies, it was interdenominational, they all participated. Um, I know of one mission society, which uh, they heard him there and they completely changed track, a track after this uh, delivery. He told them, perform African music. Don't introduce European music, perform African music. And this German mission society did so afterwards. I think it would be very much worth to look at the English mission societies and also find out what effect this talk of Balanta had on them. This is something which was beyond my, uh, it was too much to do. Now, this is a remarkable thing that he told them this because until his speech, all mission societies, the Catholics would introduce Gregorian chant, the Lutherans would do Reformation style chorales, also because they believed African music is like medieval music. So they felt very good about introducing this. Gregorian chant was a huge success and uh, uh, the Lutheran chorales went pretty well too. Not everywhere, but uh, somewhere. And the English introduced English hymns or the Methodist Sankey, Sankey uh, hymns, uh, songs which were very successful too. Uh, and I already mentioned that one German mission society completely changed track because of him. And I think there might well be more. So I have here an example from one of his articles where he explains to the reader why they have to, that why they cannot simply translate an English hymn into Yoruba. Yoruba, uh, African languages are often tonal and Yoruba is one of the tonal languages. And the English text of this hymn is awake my soul and with the sun. And uh, the missionary did not fully understand the intonation of Yoruba and the result uh, of the translation became uh, morning steel, soul of mine, steel in my sleep. Certainly not what the missionary had attended. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some English missionaries were also impressed by this. Now, what happened to Balanta after he went to Africa? He went back to Africa. Uh, he spent his Guggenheim money and did lots of recordings. Uh, Hornbostel asked, where are my recordings? And um, uh, Balanta said, I sent them. And Hornbostel said they didn't arrive. Uh, Hornbostel never believed uh, that Balanta sent them. We don't know if he sent them, uh, they might have been lost. Uh, Balanta wrote a book called The Aesthetics of African Music, which he tried to have published. Peabody, his uh, uh, sponsor, was very supportive. It was sent to Oxford University Press and Oxford looked at the book and said, we can publish it, but only if somebody revises it. Now, uh, they needed a specialist in African music to evaluate it. So th uh, there's a, again, a detailed correspondence in the Guggenheim Foundation about uh, uh, finding a specialist because there were practically none around at this point. Uh, Hornbostel had to immigrate in 1933 from Germany because he was uh, from a Jewish family. He was at this point in New York teaching at the new school, but he was in very bad health and he couldn't uh, evaluate it. But he recommended his student, George Herzog, who later became a professor at Indiana and who was uh, also then a student of Boas at Columbia University. Now, Herzog wrote two reviews of the book and I have never seen anything so devastating. Uh, 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 fortunately, I managed to get hold of the manuscript. Uh, there are problems. One can see why, uh, why it, uh, Herzog would have seen, uh, think there are problems, but there are lots of original contributions. And I think Balanta would have been much better served to find an editor to straighten them out and to publish it. More importantly, there are over 300 musical examples from all of these uh, recordings which he made. And these are very valuable uh, because they, the, the recordings are lost and this music has either completely changed or is extinct by then. Hornbostel also did not look uh, kindly upon Balanta in the end. He told Peabody, and this is one of the reasons why Peabody withdrew his support, that he believed that uh, uh, Balanta never sent these recordings. As I said before, we don't know if he sent them or, or not. This is, uh, this is not possible to find out. 
after this, uh, Guggenheim Foundation withdrew support from him. Uh, Peabody didn't support him uh, further, and he uh, died uh, in 1962, and very little uh, was mentioned about him after that. Um, it's a very sad story. Uh, so uh, if anybody wants to have the manuscript, I'm, I have it. I will be very happy to share it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. And um, as you say, a sad story. And, and um, I feel ashamed on behalf of Oxford University <laughs> for, for, for their spare part in that story. Um, and it would, I mean, is there any prospect that this, that this manuscript will see the light of day in a, in a published form or, in, or, as the, uh, or as the object of a research article or something like that? What, what sort of size of manuscript is it? Oh, it's very long very long it has and it has serious problems somebody would have to spend a year revising it some some uh, somebody yeah yeah this, but you know when i look at the musical examples they are not any worse than the ones of mario schneider uh, geschichte der mehrstimmigkeit history of polyphony and that was very highly regarded by herzog so it is really quite unfair by the way herzog i should mention one more thing i forgot herzog uh, was a, uh, had mental problems. He was bipolar, and he became a professor at um, uh, Indiana University. There's only one student who ever finished a dissertation with him, and that's Bruno Nettle. Otherwise, Indiana University was littered with unfinished dissertations because he was so tough and so mean. So, and he was particularly mean also to Helen Roberts, who worked on Indian uh, Native American music. So he, it was a really a very bad luck that uh, this book mm. was evaluated by Herzog. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, would anyone else like to do, do make use of the chat function to put a cue in to, so that I can turn to you to ask if you have a question or Reinhardt, I don't know if you have a question. If yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it, may I just say, uh, apart from this fascinating story, there are three more in the book about African music and African musicology, and uh, they are all very, very different. It's very interesting uh, that we, we, are, we have, for example, uh, by Gerhard Kubik, uh, um, a scientific exploration of the history of uh, sound uh, uh, systems, um, in tonal systems in African music. And uh, we have uh, Barbara Tidus, uh, who is actually uh, working um, on the historiography of uh, um, Maskanda uh, singing in South Africa. That is not a written history, but a song uh, history um, of the locals. And of course, uh, uh, we have Thomas uh, Robert Klein, who has given us, us a wide uh, panorama of African views of um, music itself um, in a musicological and historical way uh, that also in fact uh, combines very well with what uh, Anna Maria has found on the ground in the uh, in the interactions here uh, the views about African music uh, that are held in the world um, as compared for example in uh, Klein's uh, uh, chapter with the Africans African views themselves that is where we have to go this is the new voice you know, uh, for us new uh, the voice of the Africans about their own music. Um, we, do, we have a, a famous uh, uh, um, uh, uh, living musicologist from Africa, uh, but um, the general knowledge about uh, African musicology is uh, very, very thin on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Thank I just you. wanted to hold up the, the uh, what Balanta wanted to do was only achieved by Kofi Agavu. I think mm -hmm. he wrote this book uh, yeah. after the lectures at Oxford. So this yeah, is 2016. He, this is, he, this is he, what he was I going in that direction. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. This is, I think this is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jeremy Llewellyn has a question. Jeremy, do ask it. Thank you very much for this um, fascinating introduction, building on your previous work as well. And I look forward to reading the book. Um, I was fascinated by what you said about the title of Balanta's book, The Aesthetics. Yes. Yes. Uh, of African music and of course this project and the mediation between history on the one hand and aesthetics and the aesthetical present or whatever that is. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what Balanta meant by aesthetics. Uh, I think Balanta was a little uh, naive. I think what he maybe might have just wanted to say is uh, that it is uh, not any, uh, any worse 
than Western music, but it has completely different point of departure. I think that is uh, that is maybe what he wanted to say. But again, because he didn't go through a, a, a graduate program, he didn't have the vocabulary to ex express these things. Tobias, maybe I see you are there. Maybe you would like to say something because he, Tobias has written this wonderful article on Valanta. Hmm. Well, I mean, just for a spontaneous comment, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not prepared to say anything, anything meaningful, but I indeed think that, um, I mean, to, to, to rediscover Balanta I mean, was, was, a, was a major project also for the um, historiography of our own discipline. And I, we never should forget that. I mean, I um, also, I, can, I have written um, before Anna Maria about um, um, Balanta, but yeah. then also I can never claim that I have, um, um, I have discovered Balanta or something like that. He was known also among West African musicologists and mentioned here and there, and I took it up to a certain extent. I traced those articles she also mentioned. I didn't know the Guggenheim Foundation, um, I mean, correspondence. And what became clear to me is that here we have somebody who really, I mean, alongside Hornbostel and to some extent Herzog, who also went to Liberia, the same place where Balanta was, and some few other people in, 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 in Southern Africa, Pesavo Kirby, who tried to write something meaningful about African music around the late 1920s, 1930s, but he was completely sidelined by those um, mm -hmm. other people. Um, just take, for instance, Hornbostel's, I mean, seminal article of 1928 um, on African music or African Negro music, as it is called. Um, um, and this article, I mean, was a, was a landmark. And indeed, this is a very interesting article up to now to read. But then those kind of, I mean, um, strands of research completely sidelined Balanta into, into oblivion, literally. And um, mm. to dig him out from there, I mean, was something quite important. I mean, also for, for the history of our discipline, which is also not simply working. I'm, 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 I'm just want to mention this as the end of my statement um, by um, his, historical musicology in Europe and then, I mean, ethnomusicology in Africa or elsewhere. Um, Balanta didn't see himself as an ethnomusicologist and, and many other people also who were, who were, um, were, I mean, following his steps were simply seeing himself uh, themselves as, as musicologists. And up to now, uh, we have this discussion also on African musicology, I mean, which is trying to get somehow rid of those um, ethno, I mean, um, label. It is a very complex discussion because it involves methodological questions, which I don't want to raise now, but but then indeed, uh, I mean, digging, I mean, Balanta up uh, means something also for a kind of methodological, I mean, um, rethinking and, and, and uh, reconstitution of our discipline. Maybe that will suffice. It's just a spontaneous comment. Sorry for, I mean, I'm, I was not prepared at all to say something at this stage. Nonetheless, thank you very much, Tobias, for that. That's, that's really interesting to hear. I think just because of time, we ought to move on. There's still two more present, two, well, in a sense, three almost presentations to, to go. So our next presenter is, again, someone who probably needs very little introduction, Keith Howard, who is Professor Emeritus and a Leverhulme Emeritus Fellow at SOAS, the University of London, and was formerly Professor and Associate Dean at the University of Sydney. He has held visiting professorships at Monash University, uh, Awa Uni uh, Women's University, the University of Sydney, Hancock University of Foreign Studies, and currently at Texas Tech University. And in 2017 to 18, he was a fellow of the National Humanities Center, North Carolina. He has written or edited no less than 22 books, most recently, Songs for Great Leaders, Ideology and Creativity in North Korean Music and Dance, published by OUP, and Presence Through Sound, Music and Place in East Asia, co-edited with Catherine Ingram, as well as 170 academic articles and an enormous number of book and music reviews. From 2008 to 2017, he was editorial chair of the SOAS musicology series published by Ashgate and then Routledge. And he founded and managed the, what I pre presume is pronounced the SOASIS CD or, so, or SOASIS uh, CD and DVD series, as well as open air radio. So Keith, welcome and uh, over to you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm a little bit um, surprised that I'm down as a new voice here, but um, no problem. I apologize that I'm not. Um, I wanted to start slightly, I suppose, controversially and, and after Tobias's comments, um, yeah, ethnomusicologists, we've often been criticized for not considering history. And you know, back in 1980, there was an influential article in the journal Ethnomusicology, 
by K. K. Kaufman Chalamet, which reflected on the paucity of historical considerations, interpreting this as the lasting impact of ethnomusicology split from musicology and its subsequent dalliance with anthropology. And anthropology, as Evans Pritchard famously argued from down there in Oxford, turned against history after its precursors attempted, I'm quoting, to formulate laws of historical development by which all human societies pass through a determined succession of stages, with or without the borrowing of ideas that came through cultural contact. Those precursors, he wrote, should have been challenged because it wasn't that they were writing history, but they were writing bad history. And the distrust grew as history came to be de deemed an antiquarian interest, reconstructing a past on circumstantial evidence without collecting and considering detailed synchronic data. Now, certainly the last four decades has seen ethnomusicology take a historical turn, but it's one based largely on particularity, focusing on individuals and subcultural groups. Um, ethnomusicologists have resisted thinking of history in evolutionary terms, and they tend to unite diachronic with synchronic data. And if oral history was once considered unreliable to offer, as Richard Wittes, Wittes has it, only indirect clues to the past, this is no longer the case because the oral assumes no less value than written and archeological records. Still, establishing an equitable world in which respect is accorded to all humankind's music remains a major challenge. Um, Michael Church's The Other Classical Musics back in 2015 suggested one way forward, although I'm gonna find and will always find its omission of Korean music unforgivable. Um, Philip Bowman's Cambridge History of World Music took a, a more discursive path. And in two weeks time, there's a third and at times diffusionist approach that will hit the shelves in Michael Spitzer's um, The Musical Human, A History of Life on Earth. And in fact, the copy just dropped on my doorstep this afternoon. Today, ethnomusicology faces a challenge. If our ethnographies are interpretations of local traditions, then how can we reinstate what we've long distrusted, namely cross-cultural comparison? How can we create portraits of music using a broader brush? And for me as an ethnomusicologist, this is where the Towards a, a Global History of Music project really fits because it brings together so many people, musicologists, ethnomusicologists, and others from Europe, but also from our musical others. And not surprisingly, it's already formed or, or um, spawns a number of study groups, including the one in ICTM, the International Council for Traditional Music that Razia is chairing. And incidentally, just in, in this sort of particularity thing, if you look at the current um, yearbook of traditional music from the ICTM, which I co-edited last year, and um, we changed all the running heads because every single article we included has in its title, the place um, and a very small place, not just the country, but within the country. Um, the running heads don't because we're trying to find some way essentially to talk to each other. So while our congratulations go to, to, to Reinhardt for initiating and running the project, I want to thank him personally for letting me participate in some of the very valuable workshops. Now I'm just gonna try and share my screen here, which hopefully will work. Yep, okay. So the two chapters I've contributed um, to the first and third books essentially reflect on what I see as my role as an ethnomusicologist is essentially to document the considerable body of historical music research by Koreans and other East Asians, but to complement and if possible, add to it. Hence my article, Blowing and Hitting Korean Envoys, Processionals and Martial Music, which began as part of the workshop convened in Vienna by Morag Grant, who I think is here today. Um, now, is this gonna work? Yes. At that workshop, hearing about the Ottoman March on Vienna in 1683, clarified for me the Korean genre, chwita confirming that trumpets and in Korea conch um, shell horns are percussion rather than melodic instruments. Now the iconographic evidence for this martial music in Korea is extensive. It starts with the fourth century tomb at Anak, to the west of today's Pyongyang. And there are long trumpet-like horns in a number of additional tombs, notably in the fifth or perhaps early sixth century, sorry, this is only black and white, 
tomb of the dancers further north in what today is part of Chinese Manchuria. The written record starts earlier still with a Chinese third century document, the Sangwo Chi, which reports on drum and horn musicians being sent to a Chinese commandery in what became the northern Korean state of Koguryo. That's back in the first century BCE. However, the first written source referring to something specifically Korean um, and Korean drums and blowing instruments describes their use in the Southwest in 238 of the Christian era. So there's much to document from there right through to the beginning of the 20th century, court manuals, annals, screen descriptions, paintings, literature, and poetry. And these have been well studied by my East Asian musicological colleagues who note the considerable variation, but also the common distinction made between front and rear processional bands. Now my chapter considers two iconographical representations that my East Asian colleagues were not aware of. Here's the first. Um, and this is a 12.5 meter long ink, color and gold hand scroll, the Chosun Shisetsu Gyoretsu Zukan. And it depicts Korean envoys in 1655, passing across Tsushima Island on their way to celebrate the ascension to power of the new shogun, Yetsuna. Now, because of the lavish and meticulous detail, it may well have been created by the shogun sanctioned atelier of Kano. Um, usefully for me, the hand scroll is conserved in the archives of SOAS, a result of the government funding SOAS to purchase manuscripts in Japan after the end of World War II. And it truly is a treasure. Hence in 2017, after I talked about this in, in Vienna, I was asked to introduce it to the BBC Antiques Roadshow programme. It's online if you want to find it. Um, Korean envoys were sent to the Shogun just 12 times between 1607 and 1811. And apart from this hand scroll, our knowledge about the 1655 dispatch comes largely from a record made by a one um, by a secretary, Nam Yong Ik. And on the hand scroll, musicians appear a meter or so in on horseback, the pairs first with barrel drums, then with straight trumpets, conch shell horns, then cymbals, shawms, and two gong players at the back there. Now the hand scroll is contemporary to the events it describes. But the second representation that I've worked with for the article in, in the third book, although well known, is a memory of sorts. It's one of Hokusai's hundred views of Mount Fuji wood, wood blocks, first printed in 1834. And to my knowledge, nobody had realized that this was about music. Now, the last Korean envoy had been sent in 1811 and only reached as far as Tsushima Island. But Hokusai is actually depicting the view from the highway near um, the Temple of Fine Prospect much closer to Edo. Now, if this musical component has been overlooked until now, the point is that there are hats of military escorts and samurai with shaved crowns indicating something official. The two dignitaries on horseback you can see on the right with long hair suggests unmarried adolescents, although the samurai and two Japanese courtesans in, in um, kimono suggest otherwise. But look to the left where the band is hidden. There's a single bulbous trumpet made from wood, um, a single shawm, a two string spike fiddle, two drums, and somewhat difficult to spot, there's even a small gong suspended within a delicate stand. And put together with other sources, this is an excellent representation of a rear band, whereas the hand scroll presents a front band. And I'm gonna come out of that and stop sharing. Okay. Right, now briefly, my other chapter in the Bolson series explored definitions and practices from terminology through to an examination of how our conception of Korean music has evolved. Um, it was developed from a paper given at a workshop convened by Jin Ah Kim in Zurich. And I had to tread gingerly there because reputations, funding, and even UNESCO listings for intangible heritage are involved. Okay, this though doesn't mean that we should not critique musical givens, nor in our accounts prioritize what is said today over the documents available to us from modern history in this case. And to do this in the article, I juxtapose models from new institutionalism with accounts of individual agency. And essentially I offered an overview of 20th century musicology, performance and nationalism in what we now know as the Republic of Korea. 
Now in this, we have to be very careful which Koreans we listen to, as well as which foreign scholars, of course. So to conclude, while Korea is known right now primarily because of K-pop, its music has a long and distinguished history. And that history is populated by significant institutions as well as by significant musicians and musicologists. And we desperately need projects like Towards a Global History of Music to help us build our knowledge, but more to help us build a more equitable world in which we value, respect and understand both our musical familiars and our musical others. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, very much for, um, yeah, really some fantastic images apart from anything else. Um, can I just jump in with one kind of slightly particular question, but it just, uh, I'm curious about it. You distinguish between these kind of um, front processional bands and the rear processional bands, knowing nothing at all, I'm ashamed to say, about this, um, these bands and, the, and you know, the, the, their cultural significance. Can you just sketch a little bit what, what, what the particular functions of front bands and, and rear bands are. Well, I, I encourage you to go to the article, of course. Of course. It's a good place to start. Um, at different times, they mean different things is the answer. Um, and at, at sometimes the, the rear band was static in one place, hence you can have fiddles and instruments which really are not very easy to play when you're marching. Hmm. Uh, whereas the front bands are more the announcement of things that are happening and coming. So the front band is probably more important in terms of processions, whereas the, the rear band comes into its own when, when it's, it's um, an entertainment context, when, it, when it's something other than processionals, but with dignitaries present. That's a sort of potted history of 2000 years. Um, <laughs> the actual historical documentation shows that these things vary. Um, and of course, with, with iconographic representations as well as historical sources, we're dealing with particular instances rather than a continuation. So to, to create the continuation is, is actually very, very difficult. Mm. And to, extent, to the extent that there's any evidence about it, is there, does it seem as though, I mean, they, they have this different instrumentation. Do they also seem to have different, as it were, musical traditions or, so, or different musical materials, you might say, that are associated with them, the two kinds of bands? Um, yes, and we don't have enough information about that. Um, the material that's come down to us is, is, is largely um, for the shawms, because that's the melodic instrument in these processional bands, the trumpet or the main processional band. Um, if, if the trumpets and the conch shells are, 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 are more rhythmic, um, then you don't need notations of that. You don't need specialist musicians for it. Yeah. The, the musicians who played the shawm at different times come from different places. Sometimes they're specialists within a court institution. Sometimes they're, they're, they're brought in from the countryside uh, because they're particularly proficient on the instrument. Um, when it comes to the rear processional band, the only materials we've got come from the very beginning of the 20th century. And I think the, the Koreans are still, the Korean musicologists are still trying to work out how reliable mm. that anything from that period really is because it's the period when Korea is declining and, and becomes a Japanese colony. Right. Great, thank you. Anyone else got anything they'd like to ask uh, Keith before we move on to the, the, the last of these presentations, a kind of double presentation coming up? Well, I think, I mean, we will have a period at the end of, of all of these talks for anyone to ask about anything, perhaps some of the interlinking themes, if there are, between these various talks. So without further ado, I will move on then to the last and thank Keith again, and to move on to the, the final double presentation, which is given by uh, Daniela Fugli and Christina Richter Ibanez. So Daniela Fugli is assistant professor and director of the Music Institute of the Universidad Alberto Hurtado in Santiago de Chile. She holds a PhD in musicology from the University of the Arts in Berlin. Um, before moving to Chile, she was researcher and lecturer at the University of the Arts in Berlin and the chair of transcultural musical study, music studies in Weimar. Her main research interests are Latin American art music of the 20th and 21st centuries and musical transfers between Latin America and Europe, including the circulation and appropriation of compositional techniques, exile and transcultural biographies, 
and the reception of the European canon in Chile. She is the author of Musica unserer Zeit, Internationale Avantgarde, Migration und Wiener Schule in Südamerika, published in 2018. Christina Richter Ibanez is lecturer in musicology at the University of Tübingen. Her current research project studies the translation of popular songs and song lyrics in different cultural contexts. She received her PhD from the University of Music and Theatre in Stuttgart with a thesis on the composer Maurizio Kagel and his early life in Buenos Aires. As a specialist in 20th century Latin American music, she studies the biography of exiles and the transfer of musics across the Atlantic. She has also published on 20th century music theatre, the global reception of J.S. Bach's music, and the history of musicology as an academic discipline. So welcome, Daniela and Christina, and um, over to you for your double presentation. Uh, thank you, Eric, um, for the introduction. I'm going to start, Daniela will continue later, and then we finish together, I think. <laughs> um, I'm particularly grateful to have been part of the Bazan research project, and that's why I wish to express my thankfulness to Reinhard first for his attention and direction, for the possibility to connect with the researchers all over the world and the three publications we have now. Um, for me, it, personally, it was great to have been part of this project in a time uh, when I had no uh, institution behind me and um, to orientate myself to. Well, six chapters in the present volume are dedicated to images of Johann Sebastian Bach in Latin America and Asia. When I drafted my ideas on the global Bach reception in 2015, I had no idea that the project would result in a workshop of the Balsan project and another conference in Tübingen in 2018. A book edition I'm working on at the moment and another project I'm preparing for the next years. When I applied for the Balsan project six years ago, uh, my interest in Bach was mediated through the compositions of Argentinian born composer Mauricio Kagel, who settled down in Germany became famous as avant-gardist and composed a Sam Bach Passion in 1985. Daniela, could you go to the next step? Thank you. Through my dissertation, I knew that Bach's music was crucial to Kagel's education in Buenos Aires in the early 1950s. Basically, I wondered why Bach became a composer with worldwide reputation and his face shown on stems from China to Panama, which Daniela may show us in the next slide at the end of the 20th century. Some of the music covered in popular music or transcribed in the avant-garde. I found that musicologists had dedicated articles to the Bach reception, which formed the basis of my own research. Most of these articles were uh, edited by Hans-Joachim Hindrichsen and Michael Heinemann in several volumes 15 or 20 years ago. In Germany, Bach had been canonized at the beginning of the 20th century and the anniversaries in 1935 and 1950 were celebrated in Germany, under Nazism, respectively during the Cold War. While the German festivities had already been studied in their political context, the worldwide echo in these years was mainly unknown. That's why I looked for colleagues who would be able to add insights into the reception of Bach's music outside Europe, especially in Latin America and Asia. And um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm glad that I found young scholars focusing on Bach in Japan and Korea and Mexico and Chile and in post-colonial literature. And I'm really happy that all um, Speakers from the workshop in 2017 also contributed to the present volume, and they are all also present at, uh, now here in the Zoom conference. So I send you my wishes and thanks to all of you. <laughs> in my own contribution to the published volume, I start with reflections on Bach 
as a model for Latin American composers, such as Brazilian Heita Villalobos, Chilean Domingo Santa Cruz, Mexicans Julian Carrillo and Manuel Ponce. I then focus on Argentina between 1920 and 1950, taking an article by the composer Juan Carlos Paz from 1936 as point of departure. Paz reflects that European composers took Bach as model for composition, culminating in the retour of Bach in Stravinsky's neoclassicism and Schoenberg's counterpoints and serial canons. Past article shows that the music of Bach was as famous and discussed in Argentina as in Europe at the time. This is due to performances which I trace back to the 1920s and the 1930s. In the context of global touring artists and migration processes, German scholars and performers played a crucial role in the process, some of them living abroad while fleeing European dictatorships. They were engaged in popularizing the composer at the midst of the century and automatically spread German opinions all over the world. One important example is the conductor Fritz Busch, who performed Bach's major vocal works, such as the San Matthew, Passion and the B minor Mess in Argentina and Brazil. In Argentina, at least, the canonization of Bach at the midst of the century is a history of exile, global mobility and media in which repertory criticism and ideology intermingle. Interestingly, the view on Bach abroad became that of a universal musician, such replacing the Protestant idea of a spiritually inclined composer which had dominated not only German, but for example, British predilections of the composer. Daniela will now give us reasons for that in her presentation of her chapter. Thank you very much, Christina, Eric, and of course, Reinhardt. I am very happy to be here uh, representing Latin America together with Christina um, in this wonderful international frame. I am quoting here the last sentences of my chapter for the book, which focuses in the early reception of Bach's music in Chile between 1920 and 1950. As I show in this chapter, a general modernization of Chilean musical life was invoked during this period in the name of Bach, connecting Bach's music with ideals of good taste, intellectuality and spirituality, that were understood as counterparts to the dominant music genre of early 20th century music, Italian opera. This topic builds a representative example of a transcultural music history, since it shows that the process of negotiations that surrounded Bach's figure in Chile had not so much to do with the historical Johann Sebastian Bach, but with the Chilean understanding and uses of Bach. In Chile, the European canon is still very important in the repertory of orchestras and ensembles, as well as in music education. However, we often forget that our Bachs, Mozarts, or Beethovens are not the same Bachs, Mozarts, or Beethovens of Central Europe. In Chile, the reception was connected to processes of resignification, resulting in representations that were shaped by the specific needs of the new context. In this sense, the appropriation of the European canon in Latin American countries can be much more than an example of a colonialist attitude. This appropriation can serve the interest of local groups and although hegemonic relationships are truly part of the process, these are conducted among locals and not necessary between a center and a periphery. In 1940, the Euro, um, sorry, the Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz coined the conception of transculturación many decades before conceptions of transculturality became relevant in other parts of the world. Starting from his observations of the encounter of different cultures inside Cuba, he proposed to speak about transculturación as a process in which something is always given in exchange of what is received, a process that results in a new and complex reality that is not a mechanical agglomeration of characters, but a new, original, and independent phenomenon. Ortiz remarks 
that all participants in a cultural encounter are changed through it. Maybe it is obvious that indigenous culture was brutally changed in Cuba through colonization, but Spanish culture changed in Cuba as well. People started speaking differently, the food, the church culture, nearly all aspects of culture were transformed in some way through the new context. In the case of the early Bach reception in Chile, it was a transcultural process since it led to the development of new local discourses on Bach that served as a basis for a general transformation of Chilean musical institutions. This process led indeed to a new reality for Chilean musical life. Here we can see the protagonists of this development, Domingo Santa Cruz and the Bach Society, the Sociedad Bach. This society claimed that Chilean musical life was dominated by Italian opera, which they defined as a superficial entertainment. We are not discussing about this claim right now. Their search for a more intellectual music approach included the performance of early music, but also, for example, of French Impressionism. A first big success of the society was the Chilean premiere of Bach's Christmas Oratorio in December 1925, sang in Spanish in a concert that, that was sold out and received very good press reviews. After this event, people started taking this society very serious and this contributed to its main goal, which was the reform of the National Conservatory. This conservatory was then integrated to the Universidad de Chile, the Chilean university of the time, and Domingo Santa Cruz became dean of the Faculty of Arts. By this, he became a key figure in all further developments in the field of art music that included the establishment of a professional orchestra, a ballet, a choir, and others. During the 1930s and 40s, Bach's main works were regularly performed by these ensembles, prominently in Bach's festivals of 1935 and 50, as they were in other parts of the world, as Christina already told us. In context of this institutional development, Bach's name was programmatically connected to certain ideals and music conceptions that were used as arguments to legitimate the whole project. These conceptions are reflected in the logo of the Bach Society. It represents Bach with a quotation attributed to St. Augustine, cantet vir, cantet vita, cantet facta. The idea of singing as a message of faith connected to this phrase was highlighted by Santa Cruz in his memories, I am quoting here. A second quotation is represented in the pentagram and corresponds to Bach's St. Matthew Passion, and the moment in which people recognized the divinity of Jesus. Through these quotations, Bach is presented as a son of God, highlighting the religious content of his music. Despite of his roots in the Lutheran music tradition in a very Catholic country like Chile, the Bach society interpreted this quality as part of a subjective religious experience. In other documents, Santa Cruz refers to Bach's music as a bridge that penetrates the past, enabling a better understanding of different periods of music history, resulting in a general elevation of Chilean music culture. That was the starting point for the development of an intense concert life in the country. In my further research, I have studied similar processes in other periods of Chilean music history. Recently, I wrote about the performances of Mozart's Requiem in the public space in the politically turbulent times of the Chilean social outbreak of 2019. These performances were understood by musicians and singers as a way of protesting against social inequalities, connecting Mozart's music with a clear political function. As this example shows, Latin American societies will continue transforming the European canon and its symbolical meanings according to the dynamic transformation of the local cultures. And as we already heard a lot of times today, the study of cultural mobility requires international collaboration. I am very glad we could show um, a bit of the collaboration Christina and I have um, conducted uh, since many years. We also have um, a research network, Trayectorias, 
uh, with scholars from Latin American and European countries. And now I give the word to Cristina for some last words. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Danila. You can see um, an issue of 20th century music we uh, issued last year. Um, the next conference of our network trajectories will take place at Heidelberg in the Academy of the Sciences in October with a focus on translation and music across the Atlantic in the 20th century, reaching from classical to popular music. Moreover, Daniela also participated in my conference on Bach transcriptions in Tübingen three years ago, where we try to continue aspects of transcultural adaptation of Bach's music and images. I'm editing the conference publication in German at the moment and prepare another project on the medialization of some of Bach's compositions. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was our presentation. Thank you very much indeed, both of you, Christina and Daniela, for this um, very interesting presentation on, um, on all of these various topics. Um, Again, if people have questions, do please put a queue into or, or, or a, a, an inquiry into the chat and I will call upon you. But um, before anyone does, I wondered if I might just ask a question to Daniela and, and Christina, which is, I suppose, in the, in the context of um, debates about decolonizing the, the music curriculum, which um, I'm sure are going on in Chile as much as they are going on here in the UK and in the US and, and elsewhere. In that context, uh, there's something kind of interesting but also uncomfortable about hearing uh, um, about Mozart's music being used in, in you know, Chile as, as, a, as a kind of symbol of, of liberation or emancipation. I mean, how, how do you feel about squaring the, those difficulties of what looks like a very kind of culturally imperialist um, sort of uh, uh, appearance of, of canonical Western music in an in a utterly different context, but performing such a different, what you describe as being such a different um, function? Well, I, I think that is a good question. And, and I know the idea is kind of a little bit polemic, but I think that's the interesting point to explore. The, the question would be, is this European canon still European or does it belong to everyone who can take it, appropriate it and transform it to something very different? Is it still German after two, more than 200 years? Um, I, I don't think for everyone in Chile, Mozart or Bach or Beethoven um, are German or Austrian composers. I mean, they are, but when they imagine what Austria or Germany look like, they think something completely different to the reality. Um, composers like Domingo Santa Cruz, for example, in the 20s and 40s, they criticized the, the chorales of, of Bach's passions because they were boring, homophonic, because they, they, they did not understood them in the context of, of the Lutheran uh, community singing. They, they were not interested at all in, in this. And by this, I think they were playing with the symbols in a very, in a, in a new way, which is also a legitimate way to operate with the European canon. And um, for this case, I studied uh, with Mozart's Requiem. The piece was actually combined with some uh, pieces by um, uh, Chilean composers as well. The Chilean composers from the 60s, 70s, the time of Allende's government. So, and this mixture, uh, when I explained that to Germans, was very strange. Like, how can they play the Requiem, the Lacrimosa, and then it comes like a political hymn from the 70s. But for, for, for Chilean musicians, it's very logic because everything is part of, 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 of our heritage, I, I would say. And, and I think when we say we, we reject to play Mozart or Bach or whatever because it's not part of our history, actually this is a very colonialist attitude because we are kind of rejecting our right to appropriate this music and make something new about it. And that's a polemic, but very interesting point, I guess. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. 
Can I invite anyone else who has has questions or comments to to yes, um, Salva Castello Branco. Do you want to un unmute yourself and ask your question, Salva Castello Branco? Yes. Hmm. Uh, you're muted again, I'm afraid. Muting me, I, I unmuted, but there yeah, we go. Now you're okay, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to thank you for your presentation um, and, and for the event, of course, this is so interesting. And um, I, 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 I echo exactly what you said, for example, with respect to, to Western music in the Middle East and namely, for example, in Egypt. And uh, it's, it's interesting that in the 1932 Arabic Music Conference, which took place in Cairo, which was a historical event that brought many European and Middle Eastern scholars. I mean, uh, just, just a few moments ago, we heard about Horn Bostel. He was there, Kurt Zaks was there, and many other musicians and scholars, I'm sure you know. And, and precisely this was one of the, the polemic points uh, is that the European scholars and musicians uh, wanted um, Middle Eastern scholars uh, to stick to, you know, to, to turn their music into something um, like a museum, uh, to, to, uh, to kind of freeze it, um, looking for authenticity. And, and the Middle Eastern musicians were saying, no, I mean, we, we have the right to appropriate uh, any music that that uh, comes to our ears and to our uh, through the media or whatever or through 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 European musicians who who were living in in Cairo, for example, at the time, I grew up as a as a West, in Cairo as a Western musician, um, and uh, and for me as a child and as an adolescent, I didn't think of Bach or Mozart or Beethoven as uh, as 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 you know, Europeans, they were my composers, my musicians. Um, and this was, I felt it was my music. Um, so um, I think that that uh, I, uh, what you said resonates very much with, with my experience and, and also the experience of uh, many of my, um, my, my Kyrene uh, colleagues who have become wonderful musicians. I went on to become an ethnomusicologist um, and and um, and and they 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 play uh, fine finely European music as well as Arabic music and 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 are perfectly conversant with with both both traditions. Thank you very much. That's really interesting to hear. Fabian Levy has a question. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, great initiative of this book. I had a question about the two last uh, uh, talk to the two speakers, and actually it's a question for everybody. There is a great book by Matthew Gelbart. I don't know if you know uh, him, who shows the invention of the seven music compared to the folk music in the 18th century. And I have the feeling here we are in this problematic, generally. He shows that uh, Mozart, uh, Handel, etc., become part of the world. It's normal to play Mozart from uh, uh, Chile to Tokyo, even Stockhausen, but the Mapuche music, the Cavalli music, the Arak music, the Gagaku music are folk music, are local. It was a construction in the 18th century. And I wanted to know um, for, to the two last speakers, but perhaps for, for everybody, if you had any talk about that, because I think your initiative goes against this uh, thinking. Thank you. I don't know, Christina, if you want to answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just thought that um, the popularization of Bach in the world is also kind of um, popular culture in general, but I think that's not the point you, you were asking about. <laughs> so maybe somebody from the audience. Yeah, I would just say this. Um medialization of those composers and, and, and the functions connected to them uh, speak uh, kind of against this, this separation. Um, 
And, and the point is in Latin American societies, this what, what in Germany is called e music and u music, like serious music and, and entertainment music, is not that strange. I, I, it's not that uh, straight, I would say. So it's not that um, uh, people, uh, genres are, are more much mixed, I think. And, and that's also part of the things we should uh, analyze in detail. Um, but maybe someone else wants to complement this. I think Eric is muted. <laughs> Sorry, Keith, um, uh, you either wanted to come on this or, or, or yeah. come in on, on something, but do, well, do it's, yeah. it's part of the same thing. But um, yes, I, you know, I work on East Asia where Clearly, there are very fine pianists, violinists, and everything else, basically monopolizing most of the European and North American concert scene these days. So I, I appreciate that something like Bach or Beethoven, when it's performed in China or Korea, as far as the Chinese or Koreans are concerned, it's part of their music. That's not an issue to me, but what the issue becomes in the first book from the, 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 um, the project, there are three papers, one by me, but one by um, a, a colleague working on Japan and another working on Korea, that points out that the term for music in most of East Asia, not all of East Asia, is actually for Western music. And so the, what, what um, um, Fabian was saying about folk music, the rest is folk music and things like that, is very, very relevant. And if you're not careful, um, the local music traditions if we still value them, get pushed back into a second place. We're, we're used to hearing, say, Korean music or, or, or Taiwanese Aboriginal music these days or whatever in concert halls, and it wasn't designed for concert halls. Those stages are very much to do with the Western tradition. We're used to ideas about recording music, which are based on Western ideas of what the music industry is. And I, I think we, we do need to consider those sorts of aspects when we are looking at the impact of um, a, a Western art music tradition on the rest of the world and what it's done you know, in, a, in a way that the, the playing field can become very, very uneven. If I may add something very small, I think this is very interesting because in Latin America, we have like the opposite uh, process. Uh, all scholars are researching Latin American music and mostly popular music and a little bit uh, classical music. Uh, and no one cares about the role of the European canon in the societies because they reject it. Uh, uh, kind of as a study object because of not being part of the, 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 the tradition of the country. Uh, so this orientation is still a little bit nationalistic in its roots. Uh, and, and it would be good to come to a place in, in the middle of both, uh, I guess. Uh, may, I, uh, may I add something to this? Uh, so uh, uh, I mentioned that there was one mission society which was completely uh, influenced by Balanta and tried to introduce local music. They didn't know how to do it. So uh, there was a very impressive missionary with this mission society and this missionary taught them how to sing Bach Chorales because he just, the, the music, uh, the uh, system uh, of this tribe was too complicated. So he was really successful. They started to sing four part chorales in the 1920s. Uh, fast forward to 1971, uh, the bishop of this uh, Northern church becomes president of the Lutheran World Federation. This is huge. This is like having um, a, a black Pope, right? And this guy had been a student of the missionary in the 1920s and had learned how to sing Bach chorales and he loved Bach. In the meantime, there had been ethnomusicologists there who wanted the, uh, had learned how to perform local music there. And the bishop said, okay, we can have some local music, but my favorite composer is Bach. And he wanted to have his church musician trained in Germany to learn Bach. And the ethnomusicologists were shocked. How can you do this? 
it was a very interesting situation and why this uh, uh, president of L the Lutheran World Federation was a very strong character. He did not back down. He insisted on having Bach in his cathedral in Bukoba, as well as local music, Mad uh, Amadinda music. And to this day, he, there is a music school there and they do both local music and uh, Lutheran church music. I think this is a, a wonderful ex uh, example of this and of the arrogance of these people to tell him, you know, you should do your own music. <laughs> Fascinating story. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Well, we are really right up, or in fact, seven minutes beyond the allotted time that um, we thought this was gone. I feel absolutely that I should, I should and must hand over to Reinhardt to make um, some comments at the end. And I should say, Reinhardt, if you haven't seen it already, that there's been a whole stream of um, very appreciative and congratulatory messages in the, in the chat saying just how much people appreciate the extraordinary project that you have been leading over these <coughs> years and the publications that come out of it. I'm sure everyone would want to endorse that as well. But, but Reinhardt, over to you to, to say some final words, if you would like, at the end. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, I must thank you um, um, and all the others who have contributed. Uh, um, you are examples of what actually one hopes for, uh, that um, uh, some initiatives, uh, they are not new, or uh, um, not, not new ideas even. Some initiatives uh, cause new contacts or new appreciations or new respect. And that is... Uh, um, Amazing. That is the overwhelming bit about it. Uh, that, uh, of course, uh, um, you have to uh, press on this side um, of, of the world, and so much positive uh, thought comes out. Um, and I think many in the audience who could not speak, we haven't got enough time, and so on, uh, may also, I uh, hope, have got something which uh, encourages them uh, to press on this side uh, of uh, continuing transculturation and continuing. Uh, respect on increasing uh, um, um, among musicians, uh, but also about non-musicians um, and, and so on. In this particular time, when uh, uh, this community uh, and this uh, uh, collaboration may be also under increasing threat. Uh, we are not uh, 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 unrealistic about that. I thank you all very much and wish you all the best on your ways uh, um, in this direction. Thank you. Um, all the best for you. Many thanks, Reinhardt, and, and many thanks to everyone who's here, and, and for the fantastic presentations. I echo the, the comments of others.